Valerie, you can keep your, your necklace on. So, a week ago, I, I am so blessed to have such a wide variety of children. So, last weekend, I was with my daughter Katie, and my daughter Betsy, and my daughter Amy, and we had box seats at the Metropolitan Opera, Ooh. courtesy of my daughter Katie. And we got to see La Boheme. And then this weekend, I've just come in, I cruised in, I got here early almost because I was at a retreat that my daughter Amy ran and we had all kinds of deep discussions about personal development and what our goals are and, and where we hold ourselves back and, and we had massages and walks in the woods and all that. So I was actually spending most of this weekend in sweatshirts and now we're it looks strange because I, I was saying goodbye to everybody. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm all dressed up like that. But you don't understand. I need to tell you this is because I'm talking about going to the opera, to my spiritual community today. That is the theme of today's talk going to the opera. So, one of the most special things about going to the opera is the grandeur. Hence, people get all dressed up. You can get all dressed up. It is a chance to get all dressed up and wear special jewelry and just have this special, special time. And uh, I'm sure if any of you have seen some, there's been different movies where the opera La Boheme has been performed and people are crying at the end. Um, or you've seen, or, or you've heard music from the operas. Um, but the big thing about opera is it's grand, it's huge. And when you go into the Metropolitan Opera in New York at Lincoln Center, the stage is seven stories high. The stage. And then seven stories below the Metropolitan Opera House are nothing but sets, stage sets from all the different operas that they do. And this particular set, I mean, and they store these for decades and decades, so this particular set was designed by Franco Zeffirelli, an Italian interior designer who did many movie sets and big, you know, when it was when big grandeur, Vista Vision, Cinemascope movies were really the, the big thing. And they even, there's a, they, so many, so many, there's one scene, I think it's the third act, where it's winter time in Paris. And you can see the snow falling down, and the snow is glistening all over the set. And they, they, I, I read in an article earlier that one of the things they had to do with Franco Zeffirelli's set is they had to up, you know, replenish the snow because it's sort of gotten sort of faded and yellow, so they redid all of the snow. But to see this, these snowflakes falling down, and in, so in the front there is a, a little bistro where you can see the lights in the snow in the darkness, and then you can see a hill, and people are walking up the hill. The stage is so big that at one point, I swear there were probably 150 people on that stage. And it was about the night, and speaking of Christmas, it was about Christmas Eve, okay? And all of these uh, bohemian friends, they were probably, it would be the equivalent of a group of people who were living in Haight-Ashbury back in the 1970s, okay? Like they're trying to weasel out of paying their rent, and, and one was a poet, and one was a painter, and, and then there's this little waif girl who was sewing little embroidery things who wasn't feeling very well. And uh, they decided to go off to the, it's going to be Christmas Eve, they're going to go to the restaurant. So in one part of the stage is the restaurant. All the tables, the waiters are there and everything. Another part of the stage are all the stores and a whole courtyard. And there's steps going up and there's at least 100 people going around there and buying things and talking with each other. And all. Just huge. I mean, you just can't even imagine it. And... What's other, what are some other things? Um, chandeliers, the chandeliers, huge sand, chandeliers, and you can always tell when the beginning of the show, is, when it's going to start, because they raise the chandeliers up so everybody can see. And in the Met, 
there's balconies because you want, how I say, the people to be closer to the stage than in a regular theater so that everybody can hear. Because these magnificent voices, I mean, you cannot believe they can sing like this and they're not, they're not even mic'd up. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. And then there's the people all dressed up. There's one who reminded me totally of Rich Leninger. He was the most well-dressed, dapper gentleman. He had, he had this burgundy velvet blazer on with tuxedo pants and leather, you know, patent leather shoes and his bow tie and his beautiful white, you know, hair and just looked so dapper. That's all I could think of was Rich Leninger. <laughs> So, um, it's, it's just, it is, it's huge. At one point, oh, I didn't even tell you the best part. On this, on the Christmas Eve scene, where everybody's out celebrating, so they have entertainment for the children. So out comes a puppeteer with his cart, drawn a, a live donkey oh. across the stage. And then comes along another gentleman, and I forget exactly what kind of a coach he's, He's arriving in, but a full-blown horse is on the stage, a real live horse. Not a pretend horse, not a, uh, what is it, AI? <laughs> no, we're talking real horse here. Um, I'm sure they have to keep some shovels around just in case, but it's a real horse. So, one of the things that, uh, that is, so what, what does all this have to do with, with spirituality? I think it's just sometimes, we get so caught up in all the, the drama, which I'll talk about more, uh, of the world. Uh, we forget uh, that, that to have fun and to do things that are new and different. It's just like you were saying about you know, the holiday season. Um, there's, first I had the typical reaction, what? I'm looking for Halloween candy and they already have the Christmas decorations out. What's going on? <laughs> and then I said, you know what, I, I, this year I want to have a fun, Christmas and I'm treating myself. You know, my children have grown up, they all have their own Christmases. It's not all exactly the way I would do Christmas. <laughs> I decided, you know, I'm going to do, so I got myself an advent calendar and it is the coolest thing. It hasn't arrived yet, but I ordered it and hopefully it's not going to take it 12 weeks to get here. But it's a box and it has 25 little boxes in it. And in each box is a little miniature puzzle. Oh. And you put all the puzzles together, and you finish up your advent calendar. I thought, <clears throat> it's gonna, that's going to be so fun. <clears throat> I think sometimes, when we get, as we get older, we get sort of locked into how things have to be. And um, we forget about the richness and the beauty that we've been supplied with by spirit, by God, by divine presence. And we keep on doing the same old things because that's the way we've always done the same old things. Um, if I was always doing the same old things, I, there's no way I would have been sitting around watching an opera for four hours long. Um, and I go to the opera regularly. There's a, they, they, you know, they actually do live streams of the Met at different theaters here in St. Louis during the season. So I think even, I don't know if La Boheme is going to be shown, but it probably, I wouldn't be surprised. So, um, the point that I'm trying to make is that there's so many glorious things out there, but sometimes we cut ourselves off because we say, well, I would never do that. Sitting around listening to all those operatic singers, I would never do that. But think of all the, there's so many other things to it. I can remember going to my first rock concert when I was in my 30s because my husband took my first daughter to the first rock concert that she, I forget even who it was at this point, and he called up halfway through and he said, how long do we have to stay? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of it. Uh, and, and since I ended up being in the field of advertising and was always the ticket procurer for the entire neighborhood for every rock concert that came through, I went to ACDC, The Who, you, Mick Jagger, everything. I've seen them all, which is why I have something in common with somebody back there who's done a lot of stuff with the uh, with rock concerts with James back there. <laughs> um, and there was, I think it, it's so important to appreciate all the 
welcome life. I think sometimes we look around us and we see the difficulties and the trials and tribulations. And I think, you know, my, I just feel compelled by spirit to say, welcome life. Welcome the holidays. Well, do some different things. If I kept on doing the same exact different things that I did when I was 20 years old, I never would have ended up going to the opera. I wouldn't have an appreciation for it. And I wouldn't have an appreciation for ACDC. And I wouldn't have an appreciation for Mozart. And for all the different, uh, all different forms of music. And the same thing with art. I used to, when I was a child, I was taught that modern art was terrible. But my favorite favorite is Mark Rothko now. I love Rothko and the abstract expressionists. But I also do very <coughs> traditional watercolor painting. <clears throat> but life is meant to be, it's meant to be a banquet. And so when you have an opportunity this coming season or even tomorrow or even this afternoon to do something different or try something new, do it, do it. Embrace what all of what life is supposed to be. So that's the first thing, the first thought that came when I was thinking about the opera and, and doing this talk today. Being at the opera is that you go to a, the balcony and then you can watch everybody come in. And there's all these beautiful, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an occasion. So that's why I brought, when I saw Valerie's mother's necklace, I said, oh, it looks so perfect for going to the opera. She took it right off and she said, take it. <laughs> My mother would be glad to know it. Her, her, uh, her jewelry went to the opera. And so, and I, but I'm giving it back to you, Valerie. Oh, thank you. Um, but no, there's, there's these beautiful, there is, uh, there is a, in one of the most expensive box seats, I saw this beautiful Park Avenue grandmother with her perfect hair and her beautiful dress on. And next to her was her grandson, obviously about 12 or 13 years old. And she was taking him, maybe for his first, very first trip to the opera. But, and that, that was just charming and beautiful to see. There's grandmothers, there's uh, elderly people, there's young people, and, the, and people really, really dressed up like I was. Uh, we all got out our finery, because we don't have any places nowadays to wear finery anymore. I miss that. I mean, does anybody remember when you got on the airplane? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had white gloves on and your, your cosmetic case. <laughs> anyway, um, at the same time, in this place with these beautiful crystal chandeliers and red velvet and gold everywhere and beautiful dresses, there are college kids and music students in their jeans and their t-shirts. And they were never meant to feel out of place. They were totally accepted all from one extreme to the other. And they are all united because of their love of music. What a great lesson that is for all of us. It doesn't matter the color, the different religions, and all of this. You know, if we, are, we are all one. And we, are all, we all have a place here on this little, I mean, what a gift that on this loop, with all these telescopes and special things that NASA is sending out into the universe, not a sign yet of anything close to what we have and who we are. What a, what a miracle that is, really, when you really think of it. We are made of stardust, and we can think, and we can be conscious. What a gift that is, what a gift. And we are all united. We're all united. If we could just drop away all of those, well, I can't do this, and it's not the same as me, and people should believe the same way I do, and so on and so forth. I was listening to something. Uh, it was a meditation by, it was, it was a talk by Panache Desai, who I've lately been listening to. <laughs> he, he said, here's my great spiritual advice for you. Just let everybody else be whoever the blankety blank they want to be. <laughs> Good lesson. And then, of course, with, with the opera, you can't have opera without drama. Big drama. Heaven versus the devil. You know, uh, 
the good people versus the bad people, love and loss and tragedy and misunderstandings and all the good and evil and all, all these different things. I think that's what, remember it, well, there's not too many people here who would remember, but back in the olden days, they used to have things called soap operas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason they called them soap operas is because they were all sponsored by Palm, palm olive soap, or ivory soap, or Procter and Gamble's Tide or Fab, and then there was somebody who even did her nails with some kind of dishwashing. I forget, yeah. Marge, Madge, yeah. Madge, yeah. yes. Yes. <laughs> and of course, in order for them to have all their advertisements going on and on, there always had to be a drama, and of course, that's what the opera is all about. And uh, heaven only knows, we are all right now surrounded by drama. Drama in the world. <sighs> Small dramas, big dramas. And most of the dramas that we experience come from our own, how would I say, it's not what happens, it's our resistance to what's happening. Like resistance to Christmas by saying, you know, they shouldn't have Christmas things out in, in the dollar store at Halloween time. <laughs> or it shouldn't be this way, it shouldn't be that way. And we create all this angst in ourselves by saying the world should be different. Everybody should be believing and doing and acting and behaving the way I believe they should behave. And so therefore, things are going to hell in a handbasket really quick. <laughs> and here is, I just got this it, this was such an insightful piece of advice, and uh, it's sort of the thing that I'm going to close this talk with, from, again, Panash Desai. And, and he had two really good observations about what we're experiencing right now. The first thing he said, and I probably absorbed this from other people too, enlightenment does not mean that suddenly you're a better person. Enlightenment means you are still where you are, but you see things differently. Nice. Now, if you get up in the middle of the night, especially if you live down south somewhere, and you turn on very bright light, which is enlightenment, and suddenly you see all these things, what do you see? You see all the cockroaches, you see all the dirt, you see all the things that are wrong. <laughs> so maybe part of enlightenment is simply to know that that exists. But if we want to make a change in that, and we are expressions of spirit, which we are, we need to be the peace that we want to see in the world. So being the peace that we want to see in the world means being peaceful ourselves. And, and there's a subtle difference, and I'm, I'm not sure if I can get this across exactly, but what I got from what he said is that to be peace means not to jump into all the awfulizing. Which is a great, great, I love that uh, term that Reverend Phyllis created. I guarantee you, you will walk out of this special sacred community today and within 24 hours you will hear somebody complaining about something. Either somebody they don't like or politics they don't like or you're watching uh, you know a, a TV show where people are espousing you know everybody should be just like us and so on and so forth and um, I, the, the opportunity here is not to pile on. In other words, if somebody says, oh, I can't believe it's already Christmas, don't jump in and say, I know. Oh, did you see how... <laughs> you no, know, it's such a tendency. And, and if we're jumping in and awfulizing about how the world is, or we're awfulizing about Christmas is coming too early and they're getting... If we're jumping in with all of that, what are we putting into our consciousness? In fact, we should be so peaceful that people should turn around and say to us, why are you so peaceful? Because look at all of this. But being peace means 
being peaceful in our hearts and being peaceful in our thoughts and not jumping into the awfulizing, limiting how much we expose ourselves to uh, situations where people espouse, well, you have to be only this way or only that way. Because it's separation that is causing all of the angst and all the drama in our world right now. So don't jump into it. And that is why it is important to create some kind of a ritual in the morning for yourself. This is one of the things I got from, the, from my weekend at the retreat. To cultivate some kind of practice in yourself that is just about being peace, about being peaceful, about being calm. Whether you need to read a book, journal, uh, listen to a meditation, uh, and, and there's so many different, especially on YouTube, there are so many different spiritual voices out there with really interesting and, and, and inspiring messages. But get inspired. Welcome all the differences. Yes, everybody's different, and there's many different things out there. And it's not I say, it's not everybody else's job to make a way just for our beliefs and our way of being, you know? So, we have this one day and this one afternoon to ourselves. I'm going to end this with uh, some thoughts from Ernest Holmes. <clears throat> what we are thinking and doing today can create the kind of tomorrow we wish to experience if we will just change our out if we want to just change our outlook on life. Since today is the only day in which we live and yesterday has forever passed, the change we need to make within ourselves must be made now, today. And so we have to live each day as though it were complete and perfect within itself. We have to live each day as though all the joy there is in the universe were ours now. And we have to live each day as though all the joy we ever expect to experience were ours now. If we make every day a day of praise and thanksgiving, a day in which we recognize the divine bounty and the eternal goodness if we live today as though God were the only presence, the only power there is, we would not have to worry about tomorrow. So what we can do is live for today and enjoy today and look for the good today and experience the wonderful differences there are. And know, yes, there is drama, but internally be the peace that we would like to see in this world. Namaste. Mm.